Hello, dear friends. Welcome to America House. Uh, my name is Mariana. I'm events coordinator here. Um, so we continue our program of culinary diplomacy here at America House. And today we are really happy to invite you to the presentation of American regional cuisine by Trisha Presto, who works for the US Embassy here. And today she's going to dismantle common stereotypes that you have about American cuisine. So Trisha, welcome. Hello everyone and thank you for coming this evening to hear our presentation on American regional cuisine. As Mariana said, I do work at the American Embassy, but before becoming a diplomat, I went to culinary school to be a chef. Who knew? <laughs> so it, it didn't end up working out that way and I became a diplomat instead, but I have always loved food and food is a passion of mine and so I thought I would share some of the American cuisine with you. But before we get started on this PowerPoint presentation, I want to ask you, when somebody says American food, what do you think of? Hamburgers. Hamburgers? Okay, I heard a hamburger. And cheeseburger too. Yeah. Fries, okay. Okay, a French fries, yep. And well, hamburgers and French fries and pizza Domino's, uh, Burger King, right? That is all American food. There's so much more to it than that. Bagels. Oh, bagels, yep. There's so much more to it than that. And indeed, you know, while there are some things that every American eats all over America, there are other cuisines that are unique to certain regions and not necessarily eaten in every part of the United States. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And these, this regional cuisine, it has developed in part based on the geography of the various parts of the United States. You know, weather conditions vary tremendously when you talk about the state of Hawaii or Florida compared to Alaska. So the type of stuff you can grow in parts of the United States is quite different. And then also the type of people that settled in various parts of the United States were quite different, coming from all over the world and bringing their food traditions with them. So you have people coming from different parts of the world to different parts of the United States where the terrain is very different and the food that they can grow is very different. And those combinations created the regional cuisine that we have in the United States today. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into it. We're going to break it down by regions and I've put maps up for every section so that you can kind of see what region are we talking about. The first region we're going to talk about is the New England region. And as I said at the beginning, a lot of the regional cuisine is dependent on the people that came over to settle that region. In the case of New England, it was people mostly from England, and they came over to what they wanted to settle a new land, and they couldn't come up with a more creative name, so they <laughs> called it New England. And that's what we have today, are these states up here. And the weather was not very nice. It was not what they were expecting when they came over. It was really cold. It was hard for them to grow things. And they, they may not have even made it for the first winter. They may have all died of starvation if it hadn't been for the Native Americans, or Indians as we call them, who helped teach the pilgrims, the people from the Old World, how to plant and to fish. And they, because of the Indians helping them out, they were able to survive the first harsh cold winter in what is now known as the New England region. These are the states that make up the New England region, Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. And the various states are known for either like the type of oysters that you can find in the coastline off of the state, some of them for um, various products that they grow. And I've put a few pictures up there to kind of help uh, capture that for you. So we're talking about the Native American influence, and that's the Indians who helps the pilgrims survive that first winter. And the Native Americans had three main crops, and they called them the three sisters. It was corn, bean, and squash. And the reason they called them the three sisters, it's kind of a cool story. It's because they all grow together as a family. You've got the corn that's growing really tall, the beans would grow up the corn stalks, and the, and the stalks, and then the squash would grow in the shadows of the corn and the beans. So those three products, you could grow them all together in the same field, and together they created a balanced diet that the Indians were able to survive on. And so they taught the pilgrims how to grow those three foods. And when the pilgrims survived the first winter, and they had the first harvest after the Indians taught them, 
They all came together to celebrate, and that was the beginning of one of my favorite American holidays, and one of the most important holidays in America, and that's Thanksgiving. And we still, all over America, not just in New England, we celebrate this holiday every year. And families get together. Generally, the turkey is the centerpiece of the meal. But there's all sorts of side dishes that various people in the family will bring. You know, mom might make the turkey, but your sister is going to bring the mashed potatoes, and someone else is bringing the green beans, someone else the stuffing. And you get together, and you have a giant feast once a year in November. And it traces back to that first harvest where the um, pilgrims survived, thanks to the Indians teaching them how to plant. But once the pilgrims got established, they, as more waves of settlers came over from England, they started bringing with them the plants and things that they grew in England. So they brought over apples, apricots, plums, pears, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. They brought over all the stuff they were used to growing in their homeland and started growing it in the new states. And these are some of the um, famous foods from the region. We see up here, we've got the apple pie. That's also a very American dessert. Um, this is maple <coughs> syrup, which we Americans love our maple syrup. It goes almost on everything. And lobster, and that's clam chowder. Oh, I think I got ahead of myself here. But speaking of brownies and chocolate chip cookies, those, aside from apple pie, they might be the next two most famous American desserts. And both of them, surprisingly, came about because of accidents. Brownies, as, it has, as rumor has it, were started back in Maine when a housewife was trying to make a chocolate cake. <laughs> but she forgot to put in baking soda, and so her cake did not rise, and instead was short, flat, dense. Mm -hmm. But she decided not to throw it away, so she tried it, and what do you know, it was delicious. And so she made it again and again, and other people started making it, and today it's what we call the American brownie. Now, since coming here to, to uh, Kiev, I've made brownies. I've made a batch here if anyone wants to try them afterwards. And I even have a stack of recipes for everything we talk about here today. But I've started making my brownies by going to the Lviv chocolate shops, which are all over Kiev, buying that unsweetened chocolate in the blocks, melting it down, and making brownies. And they're delicious. So if you like brownies, you have a recipe. And I know you can get chocolate at Lviv chocolate and melt it down and make them yourself at home. Chocolate chip cookies also came about by accident. There was a company called Nestle Toll House, and they made cookies for a business. And one day they had a shelf, and on the top of the shelf was just bits and pieces of chocolate. And a mixer that was mixing the cookie dough was shaking, if you've ever seen a large mixer. Shake, 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 shake. The chocolate that was on the top shelf fell into the mixer. <laughs> what do you know? Now we have cookie dough with all these little speckles of chocolate in it. And again, rather than throwing that out, they decided to bake it up and see how it tasted. And we have the chocolate chip cookie here now, <laughs> thanks to that accident. It was a happy accident. I made some chocolate chip cookies for you today. In the States, we actually sell chocolate chips. They are a very distinct shape, and it's what every American would bake their chocolate chip cookies with. They're hard to get here, but what you can always do is buy blocks of chocolate and just break them down into small pieces. So you can make them here with the recipe up here, too. They just won't have that little chip shape to them, but they'll still taste just as good. OK, we're going to move on to the mid-Atlantic states. And those are the states of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. And you can't talk about you know, the mid-Atlantic cuisine without talking about New York City. New York City is perhaps most famous for its Italian and Chinese food, and especially in the areas known as Little Italy and Chinatown. But there's also lots of other different kinds of ethnic cuisines all over you know, New York City. The Lower East Side is home of Jewish immigrants who introduced the concept of the delicatessen to the United States, something you guys have common in Europe much more so than we did, but <coughs> thanks to them, now we have it too. Harlem is an area that's influenced by African Americans, people from the Caribbean and Puerto Ricans. And Queens has one of the largest foreign-born populations of anywhere in the United States. Italians, Germans, Koreans, Chinese, South Asians, you name it, the list goes on. New York is a very diverse city. The next state we're going to talk about is New Jersey. 
And New Jersey's official state nickname is the Garden State. And it comes from, you know, some of those early settlers who not, you know, we talked about New England and how it was so harsh and they barely survived the winter. When it came to New Jersey, the settlers found the land so hospitable and easy to grow things in. They wrote back to their families back home, this is a garden spot. We found it. We can grow things here. It's great. And so that's where the nickname, the Garden State, comes from um, in New Jersey. And sure enough, the soil is still very great to this day, and you can grow lots of things there. They produce lots of blueberries, peaches, lettuce, tomatoes, apples. But perhaps more well-known are some of these signature items that are produced in New Jersey, M&Ms, Budweiser beer, and of course, Oreos. Now, I know you can buy all of these here in Ukraine because I've done it. I see them in your <laughs> grocery stores. So if you want to try any of these, if you haven't, now next time you do, you'll know they're from the state of New Jersey. The next state we're going to talk about is Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania was settled by very conservative religious groups. If you can see over here to the right, this uh, woman is kind of dressed in a very conservative religious manner. And they're today known as the Amish people. And they preferred to live lives that were very simple, without electricity, and any of sort of the more modern conveniences that technology has allowed. And they still, many of them, live this way. And they make all of their food from scratch. So the state is really well known for homemade breads, dumpling, donuts, chicken pot pie. I mean, looking at that tray she is holding is just making me hungry right now. I mean, <laughs> that looks so delicious. But the state of Pennsylvania is also known for some other iconic American foods. The city of Hershey is one of our main chocolate brands in the United States. And Hershey makes regular chocolate, but they also make the famous Hershey's Kiss. And I apologize, I don't have any of them with me here today. But if you ever see them or have an opportunity to try it, I recommend it. I know you can buy Philadelphia cream cheese here in Kiev because I've seen it in the grocery stores. And in the United States, we eat cream cheese on everything. I mean, on bagels, you name it, we'll put cream cheese in it. And cre uh, cheesecake is one of the, also one of our favorite desserts. The next states we're going to talk about are Maryland and Delaware. And when the colonists arrived to these states, they found that there was lots of seafood and just fish and things in the rivers and the oceans on the coastline. And so um, seafood is pretty famous in the state of Maryland especially. And the um, state of Maryland has developed a famous seasoning called Old Bay Seasoning. And the recipe is secret, so it's really hard to replicate. But you can buy cans of this seasoning in the United States, and you can put it on everything, chicken, seafood. It's a <coughs> famous American seasoning, and it's delicious. The next states we'll talk about are Virginia and West Virginia. And it was a lot of uh, Irish people and German people that came and settled in these states. And then after them, the next wave of immigrants was from Ireland and Eastern and Southern Europe. Western, or West Virginia has a very little flat land, so growing crops there is pretty difficult. And so rather than growing agriculture, they ended up doing livestock and animals as the major like, uh, food product. And the chicken is their main um, source of meat there. Apples and peaches are also grown in parts of the state. And in West Virginia, they have their claim to fame because they were the first ones to grow this special breed of apples called the Golden Delicious Apples, which are quite popular in the US. We're moving on to the South, and we're going to talk uh, first about the states of Kentucky, Tennessee, and Alabama. And when the settlers first came to these states, it was like wilderness. And they had to work really hard to grow fruit, nuts, vegetables. They you know, collected honey, they raised livestock. And because the terrain was so difficult for them, the food was sort of simple when it first started out. They cooked on open fireplaces and in brick ovens, and they'd have to preserve a lot of the foods, uh, pickling and things like that. They also ate a lot of things that were wild, like ducks, quail, doves, wild turkey, geese, rabbit, squirrel, raccoon, anything they could find they would make in these states because it was pretty hard. <laughs> Here are the states in the southern region, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, and my personal favorite, because I'm from there, South Carolina. We talked a little bit about the um, first settlers kind of having to just eat whatever they could find. Here's some examples of, I'm not quite sure what, being cooked <laughs> over open flame. 
but I have tried squirrel before and it tastes like chicken. It's not bad. But <laughs> they would eat almost anything and they'd pickle whatever they could to preserve it and save it for later. Rice was a leading product in the South, uh, in the early part of the South's history. And they used to export it and they would add it, of course, since they grew so much to it, to most all of their food. It was in casserole, soups, breads, puddings. But history, including the Civil War, various hurricanes, and the end of slavery, and the labor force that came with that, sort of ended the rice industry in the South. And by the end of the 1800s, most of the rice was now produced in the states of Texas, California, and other Southern states. You can't talk about Southern food without talking about the African influence over Southern food. So it's an unfortunate spot in our history that we did have slavery. And when the slaves came over from Africa, they brought with them their food traditions. And we can thank them for that because a lot of the Southern cuisine that we now love, we have because of those traditions that they brought with them. They brought things we had never heard of. Okra, yams, black-eyed peas, collard greens, sesame seeds, watermelon. All of this was stuff that wasn't grown in the South and that uh, we didn't have until they brought it with them. And there's a term that's quite famous in the U.S. now or popular and it's called soul food. And it's, it generally describes food from the South and it means it comes from sort of that history where it, food was cooked from your soul and from your memory and recipes were passed down from parent to child to child and down, down, down the generations. We're going to talk about cheese straws. Um, I have a funny cheese straw story in that, you know, I've mentioned I'm from South Carolina, but I wasn't born there. I was born up in the state of New York, and my parents brought us down to South Carolina when I was uh, like a young teenager. And so Southern cuisine was something completely new to me. My parents, we never ate Southern cuisine. And when I started going to fancy parties with all of my friends, everyone was serving cheese straws. I had never seen a cheese straw, had no idea what a cheese straw was, but I soon sort of gathered that cheese straws are important and you know they're going to be everywhere so you better learn to like them and maybe even figure out how to make them. <laughs> and so the reason that cheese straws are so popular in the south is because of the weather, the heat, you don't make cheese in the south. There's not really a cheese making industry and even preserving cheese in that sort of hot humid climate can be difficult. So in order to preserve cheese, because of course they still liked cheese and wanted to eat it, they'd have to bake it in the form of a cracker. So by baking the cheese as a cracker, it allowed them to store and keep the cheese for longer. And every Southern cook aspires to have the best cheese straw recipe. You know, and they're served at almost every Southern gathering as appetizers, picnic snacks, afternoon snacks. And you can also just, you know, eat them with champagne when you just have a, a taste for something um, a little bit salty. And I have a recipe for my personal cheese straws, and they're in this packet over here too. So you can make them here. Um, you can get cheddar cheese at the store, and I've made them here with that, and they're pretty good. So we'll talk next about Florida and Floribian cuisine. <laughs> and the Native Americans who originally lived in Florida, they tended to live on fish and the local fruits that were growing in the region. When the Spanish came over to colonize Florida, they brought cattle and pigs with them, and the cuisine that was once based primarily on fish began to change to incorporate things like the, um, the cattle and the pigs that the Spanish brought. And it, towards the center of the state and the north part, where you can see it kind of touches Georgia and the other southern states, the food tends to be more southern in character, but as you move south in the state, it tends to have more of a sort of Caribbean feel to it. Florida is known as the Sunshine State for its beautiful weather. And in fact, all of those people that live in the New England where you know you could barely survive the first year, they often come down south to Florida during the winters to get away. It's like a famous thing to do when you retire in the US. You have a house up in New England. When the weather gets bad, you come down to the Sunshine State to spend your winters. We talked a little bit about the early settlers, the Spanish coming over and introducing meat and the um, Caribbean settlers coming and introducing some of their foods too. Sugar cane and citrus are some of the most important products of Florida. And Florida is one of the United States' top producer of sugar cane. 
and also produces nearly 80% of the oranges that make up the orange juice that we drink in the United States. Florida also produces grapefruit, limes, lemons, tangerines. <laughs> Latin and Caribbean influence. So in 1959 in the island of Cuba, Fidel Castro seized power and he wasn't popular with everybody and so there was a wave of people who fled when he took over and they came to Florida because Florida is just 90 miles away. And these people, when they came, they brought with them their culinary traditions. And so, it, especially in the south of Florida, in Miami, you have a very heavy Cuban influ influence over the cuisine. And their seasoning, their salsas, their hot food, they use them not only for um, flavor, but also because the weather and the environments where they came from, in Florida too, gets very hot. And so by making very hot, spicy food, it encourages your body to sweat, thereby cooling you off. So it's kind of practical too, but it's really good. Now we're gonna talk about Louisiana and the Cajun and Creole cuisine that's famous in Louisiana. Cajun is sort of the original cuisine of the region and is maybe more of like a country cooking sort of vibe to it. Maybe something here, maybe like in the village you might eat, whereas Creole is more of your upscale sort of city food, if you will. But as time goes by, those two are kind of blending. And so the lines between what is considered Cajun food and what is considered Creole food, they're kind of starting to blur and it's becoming harder to distinguish them one from the other. We'll talk a little bit about Cajun food. Cajun refers to the people who first settled in Louisiana. They came from Canada and they were farmers, trappers, fishermen. They were living off of the land and so kind of had a rough lifestyle. And you know, they would eat things that they were able to get from the land, including alligator, crawfish, turtles. Um, they also would tend to cook in one pot because it was simple. So they would make gumbos, jambalaya, stews, soups. But the Cajuns were well known for their hospitality. And they came up with something that is now very common in the United States. And it's called the baker's dozen. And the baker's, the word dozen refers to the number 12. And it's a common way to order things in the United States. A dozen of this, a dozen of that. But a baker's dozen is an extra one slipped in for free. So if somebody gives you a baker's dozen of bagels, it's 13 bagels, but you're only paying for 12. And it's sort of a common, fun little nice thing that um, you know, you'll occasionally be surprised with when you go to a deli or something like that. But it has its origin from the Cajun people in Louisiana. And we mentioned that the Creoles tended to be the city people, and that was when the Spanish came, they sort of started this practice of distinguishing between the village people and the people in the, the rural areas and the people in the cities. And it, they kind of created this division. The people in the city did tend to um, eat differently, not necessarily from the lands. They brought with them pigs, chicken, cattle, and they a lot of times came from Europe and brought with them their knowledge of things like sausage making and they would establish fine places to make sausage. The Italians brought their pasta, red sauces, garlic, eggplant, artichokes. So it was a little bit different of cuisine between the two. And of course, just like the other southern states, you had a tremendous influence from the African slaves that had come over. This is um, just showing some of the things that they brought, the yams, the onions, the garlics, the okra. Gumbo is probably the most famous dish from Louisiana. It's traditionally served over rice. And gumbo sort of shows the balance of all the different groups that came to Louisiana. You've got the Spanish and their love of rice. You've got the Southern fondness for okra from the African influence that combines the French technique of making a roux and thickening and darkening the stew and the Caribbean art of making it spicy. So all of those things come together to make the famous dish of gumbo. And there's two different styles of gumbo sort of in New Orleans and southern Louisiana by the, uh, the um, water you have gumbo made with shrimp, clams, and tomatoes. My personal favorite is uh, the kind that's mostly made in the southwest of Louisiana and it's made with sausage and chicken. No okra or no tomatoes. I included my recipe for my favorite gumbo, it's over here. I've made it in Kiev, it can be done. It's not exactly the same but still delicious. And uh, Louisiana has two very famous sandwiches. One is the po' boy, and the other is the muffaletta. The po' 
The po' boy is a traditional sandwich, and it always has meat in it, usually roast beef, sometimes seafood, chicken, or ham. And it's served on a baguette-like uh, bread. And the second one is the muffaletta, and that we can thank to the Italian immigrants that came over. And it's usually made with olives, mu um, salami, mozzarella, ham, cheese. Both of them are delicious. <laughs> The next area we're going to talk about is the Central Plains, and you can see it's a pretty big area of the United States. This is the part of the United States that's known as the land of milk and grain. The Central Plains are our breadbasket. You know, I've heard that Ukraine is often thought of as the breadbasket of Europe. This is the breadbasket of the United States, the Central Plains. It includes within this breadbasket the area called the Corn Belt and the area called the Wheat Belt. And then also their expertise in dairy farming has led to lots of cheese being made in this region as well. So Norwegian settlers, oh, well, here are the states first in the Central Plains. We've got Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Michigan, Minnesota, Nebraska, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. We're going to talk about the Scandinavian influence. Norwegian settlers came to the area that now make up the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin, and they found the weather and the land similar to Norway, where they had come from. So they felt right at home. Swedish and Danish settlers came as well, and they brought with them sort of their rustic stews, breads, root vegetables that were traditional foods from their homelands, and they're now staple dietary uh, products from the, that region. They also brought with them their cheese making and sausage making. So as Western migration continued, people from Eastern Europe began to settle in the Central Plains, which reminded them of their homelands. German, Polish people, Austrians, they settled in the states of Illinois and Iowa. And they brought with them cheese making skills and were soon raising dairy cows and making um, their own sausages. Now, speaking of the cheese especially, they brought with them the skill set to make cheeses that they had had when they were in Europe. So brand, the kinds of ricotta, Limburger, mozzarella, feta, gouda, cheeses that are here in Europe, that's what they started making. But then the cheese making industry then evolved and actually two of three cheeses that were invented in the United States were invented in Wisconsin and that's Brick and Colby. So we can claim two cheeses in the United States. Well, three, but two from Wisconsin. And as the cities in the region grow, the demand for meat grew. And at the time, the um, dairy and cattle were only being raised down south in Texas. So they had to be shipped up on the railways. They were shipped up to large slaughterhouses in the um, big cities like Kansas City and Chicago, where they were killed, broken down, and then sold for meat. Well, soon, you know, they started to develop in the Central Plains their own cattle industry, but they had to cultivate breeds that could survive in that climate. The grasslands, the, um, you know, it was difficult, but they came up with the solution, and today there's a thriving cattle industry in the region as well. Ranching is a big business. We talked a little bit about how the area is known as our corn and wheat belts. So the size of the corn crop increased as the number of settlers came to these areas. And um, it's interesting that with the extensive amount of corn that's grown, 85% of it is actually not grown to be eaten, but is grown to be given to the livestock to um, produce meat and everything that comes from um, the dairy and everything that comes from the livestock. Corn on the cob, we eat it plain, boiled, buttered, frozen, you name it. We love corn in the United States, as you guys do too. I actually think Ukrainians might like corn more than Americans. Because I have never in America like, walked through a mall and seen a stand where you can buy just like corn. That kind of took me for a shock and a surprise when I came here. It's quite popular to just you know, buy corn as a snack. So maybe we have something to learn from you. <laughs> We're going to talk about the city of Chicago, which is perhaps the biggest, it is the biggest and perhaps most famous city in this area. And Chicago is much like New York City in that there's lots of different ethnic neighborhoods. Hispanic, Swedish, Asian, Jewish, Pakistani, I could go on and on, I think you get the idea. And all of these different ethnic groups contribute to the food of Chicago. And some of America's famous chefs come for, from Chicago where they've sort of popularized this idea of farm to table, meaning you know, we live in the um, 
the breadbasket of the United States where all these crops are grown, let's use these fresh crops and bring it to the table and serve it to people as soon as we can from when it's harvested. So sometimes when you go to restaurants in Chicago, you're eating things that were picked from the vine that day. And that's the goal, from farm to table, having fresh food. But who are we kidding? Perhaps the most famous thing for Chicago is not healthy. We're talking about Chicago's deep dish pizza. And um, Chicago's pizza is different from, say, New York's pizza or other pizza because the crust is very thick and bready. And you could take a person from Chicago mm -hmm. and a person from New York and ask them whose pizza is better, and they could argue about it all day long. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to weigh in on this argument, but I will tell you that I have a recipe for deep dish pizza in the recipe stack over there. So, you know, you can make it at home. The next cuisine we're going to talk about is the Texas cuisine, which is called Tex-Mex cuisine because it sort of takes a lot of the Mexican influences and created its own unique cuisine. And this cuisine is probably the only cuisine that is actually unique to the United States. Um, and Tex-Mex Tex cuisine used to be kind of known as sort of the poor man's Mexican food because it was inspired by Mexican food but tended to be based on sort of the more affordable ingredients, the pinto beans, the corn, the tomatoes, the chilies. But I will tell you, this is my favorite kind of cuisine. This is what I miss when I'm traveling abroad. My parents who are here today can tell you that whenever I come home to the United States, the first thing I ask is, please take me to get a taco. <laughs> so this is my favorite kind of food. And I, I, yes, I eat a lot of it when I'm home in the United States because it's hard to replicate and it's really difficult to find true Tex-Mex cuisine anywhere outside of the United States. Texas is known as the Lone Star State. Its state tree is the pecan tree. The state fruit is the grapefruit. The state vegetable is the 1015 sweet onion. This onion is so sweet and mild it wins contests all the time, but perhaps the best part about it, this onion won't make you cry when you cut it. So that's the best thing it's got going for it. And the state pepper in Texas is the jalapeno chili. Uh, Texas is majorly influenced by the cowboys and sort of that ranching spirit. And there's five different regions of Texas. There's the eastern part of Texas, which is closest to sort of the southern region that we've already talked about. And their food tends to be more southern in character. Central Texas was settled by a lot of German settlers, and they established what is sometimes called the German Belt in, southern, in Central Texas. They brought with them the tradition of smoking meat, which then took on its own character when it came to Texas and became what we call the barbecue. And Texas is famous for their barbecue, and it in part came from that heritage that the Germans brought with them of smoking meat. West Texas is more of the um, cattle area, and they their cuisine is still based primarily on meat. The Gulf Coast, the part of the state closest to the water, tends to be very much based on seafood. And um, the weather in the southern Texas allows for two growing seasons a year. So it's like having two springs, which makes it really easy to grow crops. Chili is perhaps uh, one of the most famous, aside from barbecue, probably the other famous dish from Texas. And I've included a recipe for chili over here if you are interested in making it at home. The next region is the Southwest in the Rocky Mountains. And the Southwest, which is sort of the um, states with the stripes on them, Arizona and New Mexico, was inhabited by the Native American Indians and also a lot of Hispanic settlers. The Rocky Mountain states, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Utah, and Wyoming, were inhabited by miners, cowboys, and frontier families. These are the states in the region, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, and sort of some of the things they're known for. Southwestern cuisine. The Native Americans grew a lot of corn, squash, and beans, just like the Native Americans in New England that we talked about earlier, who grew the three sisters, which were the corn, squash, and beans, because they all grew together. The Indians in this part of the country grew those three products as well. And then when the Spanish settled, they brought with them livestock, including sheep, cattle, hogs, and they introduced wheat flour to the region. And prior to that, the staple bread of the region was the tortilla. It still is, but they were always corn tortillas. And when the Spanish came and introduced wheat flour, the bread began to be made out of 
flour, and so you have flour tortillas. And Americans generally have a preference. You know, if you either prefer your tacos made out of corn tortillas or wheat tortillas. Personally, I prefer corn tortillas, but every once in a while a wheat tortilla is okay. But every American probably has a different preference. They're the two main breads of the um, Tex-Mex Southwest cuisine. In the Rocky Mountains, they, as I mentioned, were settled by a lot of the trappers and prospectors looking for gold. And so it was sort of a, a rough life living on the frontier of America where you didn't have the cities and the transportation networks that had already developed in some parts of the states. And so the food had to kind of go along with that, with the ingredients that they could get. So they made a lot of you know, easy breads, sourdough breads, where they could start the bread and carry the yeast over to make the um, next loaf. And um, also another group that settled in the region were the Basque people from southwestern France and northern Spain. And they came to the Rocky Mountain region as shep, uh, sheep herders. And they also worked on the ranches. And the Basque started a lot of restaurants, which are still operating in the region today, known for their family service style. So rather than going into a restaurant and there's two of you, so you order a table for two or three of you a table for three, you go into a family style restaurant and they serve dishes that are passed around the table, lots of them. So they're known for that sort of style in their restaurants, and the restaurants still exist in the area today. California. So compared to the rest of the United States, California's cuisine is kind of new and somewhat innovative. And it has a lot of influences in this state, from Indians to Spanish to gold hunters, movie makers. Everybody who's come to the state has left their imprint on it. And immigration to California still continues. It's Mexican, Japanese, Southeast Asian, Italian, French, you name it. People are continuing to come to California, and it continues to influence the cuisine. California's climate is varied. You know, it's a really long state, so the top part of it can be quite chilly and cold, whereas the bottom is that sort of hot, sunny beach California that you might see in the movies and think of when you think of California. It has a lot of different geographies, and so the things that they grow are quite different across the states. Agriculture is the core of the state's economy, so growing things. They produce more crops than any other single state. And thanks to irrigation, almost every region of the state is um, they can grow things on. So California cuisine is known for taking advantage of all the things that they grow and making their food very healthy. It could also have to do with the movie industry and everyone wanting to look nice, and so they try to eat healthy food to stay nice and slim. Could be that, too. The um, cheese industry is an example of how varied the um, production is in California. They also have a cheese industry, and the, the third of the three cheeses that we as Americans can lay claim to inventing is Monterey Jack, and it was made in um, Monterey, California. There are two famous chefs from California I just want to talk about. The first is um, Alice Waters. She's up here to the left. And Alice Waters, she's an American chef who went over to France to study. And when she went over to France, she first experienced the idea of the emphasis on fresh, healthy food, things that are just coming out of the garden and bringing them to the table. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about food in Chicago. She was actually the pioneer of this farm-to-table movement in the United States. And when she was studying in France and saw that that's how they ate, she said, wow, they are on to something here, and I'm going to bring this idea back to the United States. So she brought that technique back to California and opened her restaurant, um, Chez Panisse, in Berkeley, California. And it's still one of the best restaurants in the United States to this day. And her movement, the farm to table movement, has spread all across the United States. And it really has influenced the way Americans look at food, because it used to be you know, not so important if your food was fresh. But now everybody wants fresh food, and it's just something we have started to value. The other guy is Wolfgang Puck. And he was actually an Austrian immigrant who came to the United States. And he worked at a famous restaurant called Ma Maison in Los Angeles. And it was a popular place for celebrities to hang out. And he, um, building on that, ended up becoming one of the first celebrity chefs in America. And he popularized the idea of cooking in an open kitchen where if you're eating in the restaurant, you can watch the chef cook. And now in America, you know, cooking is very popular. And we have probably dozens of chef celebrities and food shows and cooking and chefs 
come with their own celebrity now. So it's really, it's been a change in the culture and it's been kind of cool to watch. And we can thank him for that. He's our first celebrity chef. California grapes. Spanish missionaries were the first ones to plant grapes in California, but it was actually an Austrian immigrant who was living in California who thought, you know, I bet some of the grapes that we grow in my homeland would grow well here in California. And so he brought them over and they, sure enough, they thrived. And now California's wine industry can, in my opinion, compete with some of the more established European brands. It's always fun to try, right? So. I have a recipe I'm going to share with you today for ranch dressing, which is very American. It is a salad dressing or a dip, depending on how you want to use it, that was invented in the state of California. Steve Henson and his wife, Gal, they had a ranch. The ranch name was Hidden Valley. And he started making this salad dressing called ranch dressing at his ranch. And he would serve it to guests that would come over. And everybody liked it so much that they started asking, hey, can we buy this and take this with us? This stuff is great. And so he thought, OK, well, I'll start making this. He would bottle the spices up and tell them, OK, mix this with a little bit of uh, sour cream, and here's your ranch dressing. And it soon became an industry. And today, Americans put ranch dressing on everything. I mean, they dip vegetable sticks into it. They put it on their salads. I've even seen people dip pizza into ranch dressing. I think that's a step too far, but <laughs> Americans will put ranch dressing on everything. I have a recipe for it here, which normally ranch dressing is made with buttermilk, something you don't have here in Ukraine, but I used ryazhinka, and it <laughs> ends up turning out quite well, so you can do it. If you're curious, the recipe's there with ryazhinka. It's delicious. <laughs> Uh, the Pacific Northwest. The moist weather in this area and volcanic soil help create one of the most fertile growing regions in the United States. And with the Pacific coastline, there's lots of fish and seafood, which are uh, popular in the cuisine there. The people of the Pacific Northwest, like all Americans, are a mixture of histories and traditions. The first people to come were the mountain men from England, Russia, and Canada. They were looking to trap fur and to trade. The Native Americans, again, taught them how to sustain themselves. And they introduced a very important concept to the American culture. And that's the concept of the potluck. Does anybody, if I say potluck, does anybody know what that means? No. Yeah. no. We have someone. Yeah. What is it? I think for a party. It's when you come to the party and bring your own food. Exactly. So <laughs> they introduced this concept where, OK, we're going to have a giant dinner. Everybody's invited, but you have to bring a dish. So you're bringing the meat, you're bringing the salad, you're bringing, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And so by the time everybody comes and all the plates are on the table, you have a potluck. I'll show you there's a picture. This, aha, is a potluck. At work, I tried to introduce this idea to my Ukrainian colleagues. Potluck, P-O-T, like the word pot, luck. L-U-C-K, potluck, luck, like lucky, potluck. So at work, we were having a celebration. I can't remember exactly the holiday. And I said to my Ukrainian colleagues, well, why don't we have a potluck? You bring the cake. You bring <laughs> this, that, that. And I thought I had it all figured out. And finally, one of them came to me in a panic and said, we can't do this. Why don't we just cater this? Why don't we have somebody make everything for us? And we ended up doing that because they had never heard of this idea of a potluck. And they thought I was very crazy and strange for suggesting it. But it's an easy way to sort of get a variety of dishes and make sure that the whole dinner's there without having one person have to make everything for everyone. So try it with your friends sometimes. See how it goes. They might think you're crazy at first, but it might catch on. You never know. <laughs> Pacific Rim cooking is um, based on the Asian influence in the region. And um, there's flourishing Asian societies almost in every big city on the Pacific coast. And they used ingredients native to the Pacific Northwest, but cooked them in their traditional style from Asia where they had come from. And so the combination of that is known as Pacific Rim cooking. Now this one, microbreweries, this is probably my dad's favorite topic here. <laughs> Um, microbreweries were started by immigrants from southern European countries, mainly Italy and Greece, who settled in the Portland region. They planted wheat and began the beer industry. Now, microbrewery, the word micro, 
um, includes the idea of it being small. And it used to be that to be considered a microbrewery, you had to make fewer than 10,000 barrels of beer a year. Since technology has expanded a little bit, they've sort of loosened that definition, but it's still pretty small. You can only produce 15,000 barrels a year and still be considered a microbrewery. So there's, you know, you, some of the beers are in high demand because they're only produced in small quantities and the beer lovers will know which ones to get and they'll sort of, there's a market for it and knowing what your favorites are and trying to get it before it runs out for that year. Starbucks. So we don't have Starbucks in Ukraine, to my knowledge. I haven't seen any. But if you've traveled abroad, you can find them almost everywhere, and maybe someday in Ukraine. But you can't talk about the Pacific Northwest without mentioning Starbucks. The first Starbucks opened in Seattle in 1971, and today it's a global brand, but still reflects Seattle's sort of the importance they place on coffee. And the words espresso, cappuccino, latte, short, tall, skinny, they're all now part of American vocabulary. And before 1971 and Starbucks, they were not. So they've sort of taught Americans how to love coffee. Um, and the landscape in the Pacific Northwest is very diverse. Washington is considered the best spot in the world for growing lentils, chickpeas, and things of that nature. And in fact, you know, they're very popular in cuisines like Middle Eastern cuisine and Indian cuisine. You think of lentils and chickpeas. And it ends up that most of those, or many of them, are actually grown in Washington and shipped to the Middle East and India. So it's kind of something interesting. But it's the best place in the world for growing lentils, peas, and chickpeas. OK, we're going to move to Alaska and talk about Alaska's giant vegetables. So Alaska is very far north, and it's a very generally cold state. They only have three months a year where they can grow things. But because it's so far north, those three months are nearly 24 hours a day of sunlight. So the combination of that, all that sunlight, allows them to grow giant vegetables. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea and think that every vegetable grown in Alaska looks like this. <laughs> That's not the case. These vegetables, it's a, they have annual competitions of who can get the biggest type of vegetable. And you have to be trying to get them this big. You know, you'd have to cut all of the other zucchini from the vine so that the plant can concentrate on that single zucchini. So it's not exactly natural, but you get the idea. The vegetables can grow very large because of the growing season there. Salmon is very popular in Alaska. It used to be that there were so many salmon in the streams of Alaska that the Native American Indians could literally stand on the shore, throw a rock, or take a spear and catch dinner. That's how many salmon there were. But because of overfishing and pollution and encroachment on their environment, of course, there's not that many salmon there um, now. But it still is the nation's leading pr uh, producer of salmon. I have a recipe to share with you um, in this packet over here. It's a, blue, a blackberry yogurt recipe. Because one of the things as Americans, when we think of the Pacific coastline, we think of people who eat yogurt and granola often. And uh, I'll share my recipe for yogurt with you. The last and final state we're going to talk about is Hawaii. And Hawaii is a chain of 132 islands. But they're pretty recent, actually. They were made from volcanoes erupting in the sea. And before settlers came, nothing edible grew on the island. So that everybody that settled had to bring with them plants and things that they could eat. The first settlers were from um, Polynesia, and they brought with them the um, taro root, which we'll talk about here. Uh, this became the main staple of the Hawaiian diet, and it still served at luau's and important festivals to this day. Every part of the taro root is edible, from the root in the ground to the stalks, and um, it comes in hundreds of varieties. In addition to taro, the Polynesians brought breadfruit, banana, coconut, sugarcane, and pineapple. By the end of the 19th century, sugar and pineapple plantations had taken over the islands, and Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Korean, and Portuguese workers who had come to work on those um, farms had brought their food traditions with them. So things like tomatoes, peppers, rice, and Asian vegetables. Hawaiians have a famous lunch. It's called the plate lunch. And it generally consists of two scoops of rice, one scoop of some sort of salad, either a potato or macaroni salad, and meat. So another variety, which I have pictured here, of that plate is called the loco moco. And it includes a hamburger patty with a fried egg and some gravy on top of it. 
They eat this with chopsticks, salt and pepper, and soy sauce. And another thing Hawaii is famous for is Spam. And Spam um, came about when fishing around the islands was prohibited in World War II. And so they had to come up with some other source of meat for their diets. And so um, they started importing Spam. And Spam is most commonly fried and eaten with rice, but it can also be roasted, deep fried, or used in stir fries. Probably the most famous way to eat Spam is this right here is pictured. It's called Spam Musabi. And it's made when you take a rectangle of sticky rice, which you can see at the bottom, then putting a piece of Spam over it and wrapping it in a piece of dried seaweed. And that's probably the most famous way to eat Spam. I personally don't like it. I can't make myself like it. I've tried it several times, but it's famous in Hawaii. So if you go, you can have some. Um, I have a recipe for mango bread, which I do love. It's in this packet. Um, and that's also a Hawaiian recipe. And that is the end of the presentation. But at this time, I'm happy to take any questions you have. And if I don't know the answer, I may ask some of the other Americans in the room who come from different states to help me out with the answers on your questions. Is Jamaican food popular? And if yes, where? Um, yes. I, I wouldn't say it's one of the most well-known cuisines in the United States, but you can certainly find it. Probably in every city you'll find a, every major city you'll find a Jamaican restaurant. There was one. There was one um, in Washington, D.C., where I worked several years ago. There was one like two blocks from us on the corner. So you can get it, and yeah, people, people like Jamaican food. It's spicy. Is there a lot of uh, healthy food? <laughs> uh, maybe for now it's like new yeah. tendance. Uh, you have in the uh, U.S. Uh, for some fresh or healthy, something like this? Yes. Tradition. You know, as I mentioned, that sort of farm-to-table attitude towards food is starting to take um, root in the United States and there is an ever-growing segment of the population that is concerned about eating healthy but you know I think you have all heard the stereotypes about Americans and maybe you know we're not the skinniest people around you know um, and some of that is true and because of sort of diets focused on fast food but there is certainly a push in the culture to change that and to change our focus from fast food towards the farm to table healthy food and of course, not every American is embracing that, but there's a large crowd of Americans and a cultural shift towards that as well. But if it's uh, possible to find some uh, good uh, and uh, some uh, healthy food in, Absolutely. in the water? Absolutely. Is it possible? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, even in, like, let's say you go to a Chinese restaurant in the States or you go to a Mexican restaurant, a lot of times it's all about what you order, right? You can go to a Mexican restaurant and order a salad with shrimp and maybe like a small bit of cheese on the side and it's still Mexican food but it's healthy as opposed to going to the same restaurant ordering the enchilada covered in cheese with a huge pile of rice and a giant coca-cola with it so you there are healthy choices wherever you go in the United States even if you ate at McDonald's every day I mean you could eat healthily at McDonald's every day by choosing certain things on the menu and not choosing the unhealthy items on the menu so there's healthy food everywhere yes in the United States one of, no, the no, slides oh, One of the slides you had with like the state famous for, uh, it was said grizzly bear. <laughs> okay. They don't eat grizzly bears, right? <laughs> no, no, I don't think anybody is eating grizzly bear. But you know, <laughs> it's not a popular food dish in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was like, wow. <laughs> no, good question. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, what's your perfect chocolate chip cookie? Chewy, crispy? Oh, that is a good <laughs> question. I personally think it's less about being chewy or crispy and more about getting the blend of sweet and salt right in it. Because if you have the blend of salt and sugar right, it's so addicting you cannot stop you know, continuing to eat the next cookie. But sort of if you don't have that blend of salt right, mm, it's sweet, it's good, okay. But getting that blend of salt right is the most important thing, I think. And what about chocolate? Should it be like milk or... Chocolate, chocolate chip cookies in the United States are generally made with semi-sweet chocolate, which is more sweet than an unsweetened chocolate, but not quite as sweet as, like, say, a milk or a chocolate you might just like eat in a candy bar form. But you can make it. The ones I've made here for you to try today, I actually ran out of semi-sweet chocolate chips, so I had to look for what other chocolate I had in the cupboard. And there's some milk chocolate I chunked up and threw in there. I threw in some bittersweet chocolate. So it's a mix of chocolates. You can make them with um, 
any different kind, but semi-sweet is probably the most popular. In Ukraine, many, peop many people is afraid of uh, GMO. Uh, uh, what about American people? I would say there's a significant part of Americans that are also afraid of that. And I think, you know, it, that tends to be people who are concerned about the health of their children and some new diseases like autism that you're seeing the rates rise. And so people are looking for explanations of why are the rates of certain diseases rising. And so they're starting to look, well, if the rate of this is rising, what has been changing in the meantime? And so GMOs have sort of come into that question of perhaps are they linked to certain diseases or unhealthy, you know, trends that we're seeing? And, you know, I personally don't look at the GMO label when I'm buying food, but many Americans do. So it is certainly something Americans are conscious of. What about gl gluten? Oh, gluten. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gluten is also a big concern in the United States. And, you know, there are those people who really are gluten intolerant. And then there are people who maybe they think gluten makes you fat or for whatever other reason will avoid eating gluten as what well. Is this? <laughs> um, gluten has to do, to the best of my understanding, and I'm not a scientist, but it comes from wheat. And so the problem is that, you know, it's easy enough to think, okay, I just won't eat wheat products. But the way grains are grown in the United States and in many product in many places, oats, wheat, corn, they're all grown sort of together or so close that when the crops are scooped up and processed, you can't 100% guarantee that in this oat batch there's no wheat. And somebody who is truly allergic to wheat might eat something that's supposedly corn, but unless it's produced very carefully, they might still get sick because there's that like little bit of wheat that was gathered up with the corn. So gluten is a big um, you know, issue in the United States and people that are gluten intolerant or cannot have gluten will read labels carefully. And, and companies are catering to that market of people that are gluten intolerant, and you'll see labels on food that yeah, say like gluten free. Because uh, fruits can be like gluten free. I know. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. It's. I think some of it is maybe just over labeling, <laughs> you know, to try to sell <laughs> sell things. But so. are there any other questions? <laughs> uh huh. Well, let's start with the cooking. You have to have a big oven to cook a turkey. So Ukrainian ovens tend to be smaller than our gigantic ovens in the United States. So your ovens are probably like mm -hmm. this, right? Mm -hmm. Our ovens in the United States are probably like from here to the ground, right? Like, <laughs> so you take out the racks, you put just one rack on the bottom, and then you can fit your gigantic turkey in the oven. So you might have a, an issue. You might have to get a small turkey if you wanted to replicate <laughs> Thanksgiving. But then as far as eating it goes, there's two solutions. Either you just invite more people over for Thanksgiving dinner and make sure that turkey is all gone by the end of the dinner, or you have leftovers. And Thanksgiving leftovers are sometimes eaten weeks after Thanksgiving. My mother, who's here in the back row, is, you know, could tell you a dozen things to do with leftover turkey. And it starts, everybody's excited for that original turkey, right, on Thanksgiving Day, like, oh, it's the best thing ever. Ask them a week later if they want to eat turkey <laughs> again, and, you know, no, it's not so exciting. But that's, that's how we eat the turkey. Are there any other questions? Peanut butter is very popular. Yeah, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are probably like the iconic American childhood sandwich. And peanut butter, you know, I mean, it's chocolate and peanut butter, Reese's cups. The Americans love peanut butter. Yeah, that's very true. Good point. Any good places where Chicago style pizza in Kiev? I have not yeah. found one yet. Does yeah. anyone else know of any? <laughs> When I am craving a deep dish pizza, I make one. And now you can too, because there's a <laughs> recipe over there for you. Did you have a question? Yeah, what's the most American dish for you? Mm. This probably and dessert. Yeah, I think probably the chocolate chip cookie is the most American dessert dish. I mean, I'm going to go back to sort of tacos, right? Because I could eat tacos every day and not get sick of them. So that's what I think of when, <laughs> when I think of American food. And that's what I miss most about the US. Oh, one more question. Uh, what about 
ready for all this cake. Okay, yeah. Like American? Or I'm, I don't know the origin of red velvet cake. Does anyone in my audience back row know the origin of red velvet cake? Okay, we, I, I must say I don't know the answer to that. I've made red velvet cake, but I'm not sure about the origin or where it came from. So sorry about that. Anything else? Well, thank you guys so much for coming. And don't forget, there are brownies and chocolate chips and recipe, chocolate chip cookies and recipes up here at the front. There's probably not enough for everybody to try one of each. <laughs> so please, you know, be considerate of others. Just choose one, either a cookie or a brownie if you'd like to try. And then if there are extra left at the end, by all means, try the other. But I didn't quite anticipate such a large crowd. So thank you for coming. Thank you.